All right. Welcome back to The Productivity Show, a podcast where we believe you can get everything done without having to sacrifice your health, family, and things that matter to you. My name is Brooks Duncan with Asian Efficiency, where we help people become more productive at work and at life. And this is so and in this episode, I'm super excited to welcome Leslie Josell. She's the founder of Order Out of Chaos and is an ADHD academic and parenting coach. And her help and her company helps parents guide their students to success in learning and in life. She also created the award-winning, can't wait to hear about that, <laughs> Academic Planner, which is a tool for time management. So welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much for being here. How's it going? Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. This is going to be a good conversation. All right. Well, in this episode, we are going to be talking about productivity and procrastination, (laughs) topics we talk about a lot on the Productivity Show, but it's going to be a little bit of a different spin because it's going to be a special focus on students. And uh, one thing I learned from Leslie, so again, I'm looking forward to hearing about this, 90% of students procrastinate, but the reasons are apparently very, very different than with adults. So we're going to be diving into that. We're going to be sharing some special strategies to help students in your life manage their time, develop smart study skills, become functional procrastinators. Mm -hmm. And one thing I do want to say is even if you don't have kids, uh, student age or otherwise, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of great productivity tips that you're going to be able to take from this episode. So even if you don't have kids, I think you're still going to get something from this. We are going to be sharing a lot of resources and tips and stuff like that. And you can find links to everything that we share in the show notes by going to theproductivityshow.com forward slash 385. All right. So for those who listen to the Productivity Show regularly, you will know that we start every single episode with what we call our top three resources. So these are three things that we have been liking lately, who have been helping us lately. Ideally, they're tangentially related to productivity in some way. Uh, And when we have a guest, so Leslie, thank you for being a guest on the episode. Uh, What we like to do is, yeah, we love to uh, put them on the hot seat and see if they have three productivity resources uh, that they want to share. So Leslie, uh, do you have three resources? resources you want to share with us? Of course I do. I am so like narrow and deep, meaning I sound like a broken record. So remember, I'm coming at you from a student perspective. So my three recommendations for students is an academic planner, and it does not have to be mine. I just want to make that clear. So quickly, an academic planner, because your students need to see time in order to learn how to manage it. Um, So they need a planner that actually has planning capabilities. The second resource is, and I'm going to tell you that I, this is for adults too, is that analog clock sitting right behind you. Everyone, I don't care if you're 8, 18, 38, or 88. If you want to, again, manage your time, you need to see time and you need an analog clock to help you do that. And then shameless plug, this book that I wrote, I'm sorry, it is jam packed because it's written for students. It is written for teens and college students about procrastination, and it gives them information on how to study, how to plan their time, prioritizing, even how to deal with distractions, organizing, and everything under the sun. Did I do that in 90 seconds? I think it is. That was was perfect. So like I mentioned, we're going to have links to all of that at theproductivityshow.com forward slash 385. Uh, And for those listening to the audio podcast, uh, when we say analog clock, we mean those clocks on the wall (laughs) with, you know, hands and and, uh, stuff like that. Uh, So not a digital clock, an analog clock. And actually, before we get into the, yeah, yeah. And uh, so just out of curiosity, what is it about an analog clock? that you think is more helpful or ideal than a digital clock? Than digital. Okay, so I do this with my students in webinars or coaching or whatever. And I say, pick up your phone because you know it's right next to them. Pick up your phone and tell me what time it is. And they'll say, all right, it's two, it's 2 p.m. Great, show me on your phone 10 minutes from now. <laughs> Dead silence. Show me 20 minutes ago. Show me on your phone how much more time you have until you need to go to your next class or the class is over and it's dead silence because your phone or digital gives you one time. It gives you the present. And to truly, I keep saying it, to truly to be able to manage your time, you need to be able to see it and you need to be able to see the sweep of time. And what's so fascinating to me, and I'm a time management expert, this is my jam, this is what I talk about, is time is three-dimensional. Time Time has a beginning, a middle and end. It has a future, it has a past. And when you look at an analog clock, it gives you that. You see 
you see time move. So for me, that's why an analog is so important because the other reason is that it allows you, and I feel this is really important, is to really see time or really get a feeling for time. You need to, ex you need to externalize it for it to be internalized. And, a, and an analog does that. You know, organically, you're looking at a clock and watching time move. You organically pick that up internally. Oh, I have five minutes or, oh, 10 minutes have passed. You don't get that same feeling by looking at your, by looking at your phone. I love that. Right on. Even if, uh, even if you have to hit stop on your, uh, po on this podcast, if you're getting off the train or whatever, you've already got a super solid, uh, time management <laughs> tip. So that, <laughs> that's super. I'm so fun. glad, but it's true. <laughs> and, and my, my tip within a tip is, and this is for all of you who are listening out there that do have kids, you need a clock, an analog in every room that your student spends time in. So there needs to be one. And my fun fact is because we coach mostly um, high school and college students and we we make it a requirement if we're coaching you in college, you still have to have an analog in your dorm room. That is a requirement. I mean, it's not a big one, but it's important to us that you see time. But you need to have one in every room. There should be one in the bedroom, the bathroom, the kitchen, whatever room your kid is spending a significant amount of time in. And if they're a teen, we think you need two clocks in the bed in the bathroom one by the sink and one by the shower. And I think if those of you who have teens at home know exactly what I'm talking about. You, they get lost in there. So a tip within a tip. Love it. Uh, all right. So uh, usually people don't just like magically become time management experts. Uh, no. There is usually like a path that, le that leads them to somewhere. So, uh, you know, I gave a little bio at the beginning, but maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, who you are in your own words, sure. what you do and like your background, how you got into this stuff. So I started my, I am old. I started my company um, 17 years ago when my son at the time was five. So I'm not going to, I want to give you the reader's digest version because I know we're pressed for time. So he was diagnosed with ADHD and executive dysfunction and a whole host of other things. And back then, you have to remember, there wasn't a lot back then. There weren't podcasts and conferences and webinars and all this great stuff. So I relied a lot on my gut and instinct to figure out ways to untangle his world, both at home and at school. Um, and back then, I probably did things that you would consider revolutionary, like a hanging analogs or taking closet doors off, off, off closets because what he didn't see didn't exist that whole like ADHD brain and true story. I had a lot of people who saw what I did, like friends of mine who said, I have friends of friends who need you to come and do this. I didn't do this for a living. I had a job actually. Um, and the phone started ringing. And I remember I turned to my husband and went, I don't do this for a living. And he said, well, you do now. And that's literally how Order Out of Chaos at the time was born. At that time, I was going house to house, family to family to build systems and structures and teach these EF skills, executive functioning skills to the families so that they can then in turn teach them to their kids. Now, 17 years later, we are global. We are virtual. We have about 75,000 people who come to Order Out of Chaos for products and programs, workshops, webinars, coaching that you can all get. But time has always been like the thing that I really focused on because I found that when a child really doesn't see, you know, a student doesn't see themselves in time, it really, really, I mean, everything affects them. But that was something that really resonated with me when I would be working with a student. And that's 10 years ago. That's how the academic planners got born. And I mean, I'm leaving a lot out. We are, of we course. went from that to 17, <laughs> but you can go on our site and read all about it. But I feel like and I think the reason why we focus a lot on time is because that tends to be what parents talk to us about is that time, productivity, procrastination wheel. So you tend to focus on what people come to you for the most. We should probably, right? yeah, we should probably define what we're talking about when we're talking about students. You know, we talked about the, this, uh, this episode being, I know, students. I'm sorry. you mentioned, no, no, it's, 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 it's good. Uh, you mentioned that you worked, you work primarily coaching like high school age and college age. Is that like your I main do. focus? No, uh, not. So again, we are a very big company and people come to us for webinars. So you can come whether you have an elementary school student, a middle school student, high school. I still coach, which some people find interesting. I will never not coach. I feel like to do all the writing, I, I write just, just so people know, I write the weekly 
um, Dear ADHD Family Coach column for Attitude Magazine. So I write a weekly column, I speak all over the world, I write books. If I'm not in the trenches doing that work and using my students, and I say this lovingly, as a laboratory, then I'm not bringing value to my community. But we service really middle school to college is who we service as coaches, but we service all parents, and we call this with all able learners, with our workshops and webinars. Does, does that, does that make sense? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. And it, it sounds like, you know, you mentioned, um, working, you, you're a column, uh, ADHD coach and you, uh, you have worked with many people in, in the kind of like neurodiverse ADHD world, but it sounds yes. like this, the stuff we're going to be talking about today can apply either way, right? Like to all that yes. age range and, and either way. Yeah. So I, you're going to laugh and I don't, I have, I say this, a lot of people call me like the Taylor Swift of the ADHD <laughs> world and that I actually am, I tend to view things very differently. I don't look at like, okay, here's advice you give to mainstream students and here's advice you give to neurodiverse. I believe in something called universal learning. It is exactly how I run my company. It's how I give every talk because we all know what universal design is. You know, it started with like the curve cuts and that was put in for a certain population. Those might be physically challenged, but we found that everyone benefited from it, whether you were pulling a stroller or luggage or what have you down the street. It's the same thing with universal learning. Everything that I am talking about it's maybe it started with a child or a student that might be neurodiverse, but doesn't a student who is maybe a little more mainstream benefit from tactile learning and movement and, and anti-boring tools and all that good stuff. It's really universal what I'm talking about. It's, and, and in fact, to the point where it shouldn't be differentiated. So I come, I come to the table, I think that way, which is interesting because if you read my book, actually, it is not geared. It does not talk about ADHD or neurodiversity or executive challenges. It talks about procrastination as something that happens across all students because, you know, we're, this is not a black and white subject. Kids, every, you know, you meet one kid, you meet one kid. So that for me was super important that what we're talking about is really about what I like to say, all able learners. Well, I'm glad you mentioned procrastination because uh, that that uh, factoid I touched on at the beginning about how um, you know students crazy? students procrastinate like 90% of students procrastinate. I have two teenage sons, so uh, we've got 100% 100% in this household. Let's just say, but you know, you mentioned that students procrastinate differently than adults. So maybe right. you can talk a little bit about the the background of that number first of all, sure. uh, and that like so that what number's the not my are. number. That sure, number's not my yeah. number. And I, I could always give you the, you know, the, the study that was done, but it was so fascinating to me. It was done for thir just so people know it's like um, it's teen. So it's like 13 up. It was, it's not, it's not elementary school. And that's really not something that we focus on because parents have tremendous amount of control in that young age, what happens, when it happens, how it happens, all of that. And the control tends to dissipate as a, as a student gets older. The other thing that that number I want to make clear is that is, you know, procrastination is not black and white. So it's not like I procrastinate or I don't. Procrastination to me is a continuum, right? I mean, you know, you mentioned the word like functional to me. There are plenty of people that are functional procrastinators. We talked about that. But here's um, what happened. And, and I have to talk a little bit about my book to bring you the anecdotal information. So no I've been in the field for 17 years. And when I was asked by my publisher to write this book about procrastination in students, I said it was really important for it not to be only in my voice, but that I bring in the voices of all the students, as many students as I could recover and, and, and go back to talk to and interview from all of those years. And granted, a lot of it I knew, because when you're in the trenches, you learn this, that what was really fascinating to me and what's been really fascinating to parents is to understand that there are several reasons why your student procrastinates and it does look different than an, than an adult. Number one is choice and control. And this might be where that neurodiverse brain might come in here, whereas students are told day in and day out how to do something, when to do something, where to do something, and I could keep going. I think you yep. get the drift. 
And they're not, right? They're not given the choice and control of showing how they might know something in a way that works for them. So right away, you're, you're working against what I call your best practices. They want to be able to show up and say, you know what, I might not be, and this is as granular as it gets, I might not be the best test taker, but I'm really good at making like a website. And so I'm going to show you that I understand Mesopotamia by, by making a kick. Oh, I don't want to, a kick, you know what? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I work with kids. So I have a little bit of a powder <laughs> mouth, but I'm going to show you how much I really know by letting me do it in a way that works for me. So choice and control was a theme through not only my, my 17 years of working, but all of the interviewing we did, like, what was it about procrastination? Why? And it was, it came down to, I wish I had had more control and more choice on how I did things, not only how in school, but also at home. And that's where we do a lot of parenting work. The other one that really resonated, but I kind of knew it too, was skill. A lot of procrastination shows up in your student because it's skill-based or a lack of skill. Bottom line, if your student doesn't know how to do something, they're just not going to do it. Not because they woke up in the morning and want to like, I want to try to make this clean, want to like make their parents, you know, be annoying to their parents. I think you know what word I want to use, but I can't, yep. <laughs> right? They don't do that. It's like, if they don't know how, what you're doing to that brain, remember the brain is underdeveloped or, or, and I don't want to make this an executive functioning lesson, but our executive functions do not fully develop till we're in our mid twenties. Some will even say later. So now you're working with a child whose executive functioning skills are not fully developed. So the more you have to put that stress on that brain, the more they have to figure out on their own, the think of like a boulder to squashing that head, like adding more and more bigger, bigger, bigger rocks. It's a great visual. Your kid can't figure it out. So if they can't figure it out, they're not going to do it. So that those two really big things were choice and control and skill. Number one, we don't talk a lot about that at all when it comes to kids and they talk a lot about procrastination in adults, and I don't want this to be a procrastination adults thing, but they talk a lot about it in terms of time and mood. Mm -hmm. We don't, Wes, we do talk about mood and time and all that, but they're all on the same level playing field. Yeah. But choice and control and skill really kind of came to the forefront. The control thing is so interesting because I never it? really, I never really thought about this till you were just talking about that. How, especially as parents, you have an idea of how they should do something. Because first of all, when we were in school, we had no control. You know, nobody knew about any of this stuff, oh, right? Oh. Uh, and so, so as a parent, you have a specific idea about how something should be done, how an assignment should be done, because you're viewing it through the filter of what you had to do when you were in school so a, I, and, and B, I don't think we remember things that we did 35, 40 years ago or whatever, as well as we think we do. So <laughs> we, we don't really have an accurate representation of this no, thing we're we trying don't. to hold them to. So that's, yeah, that's, that's, I guess that takes a lot of unlearning on the part of parents of, of, uh, the way you might have done something in the 70s, 80s, whatever, uh, 90s, I suppose, depending on how no, old well, people I'm not, are listening. I'm, young. I'm yeah. old, I mean. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm old, me too. But uh, so it's like you you really have to unlearn this stuff that we were all had to do and it's uh, and just be open to this new world, so to speak, um, that's happening now. So I would love, because what you said is so brilliant and what I want to say, which I feel maybe we, I should have said at the beginning is what definition of procrastination I use. Mm. So here's the interesting thing. Most of us, when we talk about procrastination and I'm going to, I'm going to do this through the lens of a parent. Okay. Not through an adult. Like I want, I know this is a little bit nuanced, but there's the lens of an adult versus the lens of a parent. So I want it to be through the lens of the parent who will come to us and say, my child procrastinates. Okay. Why do you feel that way? because they put things off yes. and they stop there. But the definition of procrastination is you might, is putting something off. And let's, let's finish that sentence. 
knowing that there is a consequence you're going to face on the other side. And that's the piece of the definition. And I'm not here to disparage parents. This is, they, they are my community. I love them. They love me. I am one, but I've learned this so much is that's the piece, that's the piece of the sentence that's missing. So let me ask, and I, and I challenge parents sometimes, and I'll say, let me ask you this question. You want to like get up in the morning. You're going to get up on Saturday morning. You want to clean out that garage. It's been sitting there. You know, it's a time, whatever reason you want to get it done. And you, you're all ready to do it. And, and you have it. And you keep telling, you know, your spouse or your partner, we're going to clean it out. We're going to clean it out. That's what we're doing. Saturday rolls around and it's a gorgeous day. And you're like, hey, you know what? I'm not going to do this. I want to go to this. I want to take a bike ride. I want to do whatever. Are you procrastinating? No, because is there a con now you might be selling your house, you might have to get that cleaned out by right. Wednesday, then yes, there is a consequence. So when a parent shows up and a student shows up, and this has happened, and a parent goes, he has an assignment, it, it's due Tuesday, it's Friday, why isn't he working on it? Why isn't he working on it? He should be working on it. He has nothing, should I keep going or do I sound like a parent? Yeah. And the student, I this actually happened, and the student turned, I had them, and I don't normally do it, but I had a student and a parent both on the Zoom together, and the student very calmly, he was 16, turned to his, and it was his mother, but again, it could be, trust me, it's both, there's no, no one gets special privilege here, but the kid who was 16 turned and said, my assignment is due at 11.59 on Tuesday, you get to yell at me midnight Wednesday. <laughs> How interesting was that? But it's to the point you made. There's a lot of should. So some people might call that student a functional procrastinator. He knew that waking up on Saturday or Sunday and, and locking himself in the room and just seeing that time horizon, we're going to go talk about time, right in front of him, gave him that, that adrenaline or that motivation or that focus and drive to sit down and get whatever it was done. And trying to get something done two weeks prior did not work for him. He, he couldn't do that. Is he procrastinating? No. He's, and now, and I know a lot of parents are going to be like, but of course, no, and not in my world, he's not. He's a functional procrastinator. He's, he knows he has an assignment. He sees it. He sees the time, he knows how much he needs, and he was able to finish it with no stress, get it in, doing what worked best for him. Interesting, right? That is interesting. What We what see a lot from? of that. We yeah. see a lot of that. A lot of that. So maybe, it, maybe it's because I, I guess the thing that pops in my mind is, and I suppose this is the main thing, is actually having this conversation with your kid and knowing your kid, but... Like, how do you know the difference between that functional yeah. procrastinator who is making because this determination? <laughs> yeah, making this determination. Okay, I have two weeks left. Uh, it's going to work best for me to start working on right. it. Like the morning, the difference between that and uh, somebody who uh, their kid uh, is not it yeah, is not is not um, making this informed decision of and calculation of what they can do when they're just don't even know what's going on and, and like forgetting no, about and that it. Is, and like, that's yeah. very different. But my point in showing you that was because we talked about is that procrastination isn't black and white, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And there, that's what I wanted to show. And and it's also someone's perception of what they're seeing. That's really that point. That point wasn't to say like he had all his ducks in a row and that's an easy right. out. The point of that was to say like, here's, here is a parent who might be going, he should be doing it this way. And here's a student turning around and saying, uh, hang on a minute, I'm not procrastinating. That doesn't work for me. This is what works best for me. And some people do label that as a functional procrastinator. At least I'm getting my parents to formulate that word because it makes them feel better. Remember what my definition of procrastination is. It's, it's delaying or not doing at the, at knowing there's a consequence on the other side. That for me, as a, as, a, as a parent, as an academic coach, as a parent coach, as everything, that's 
true procrastination. So you will know if your kid goes on Sunday night, oh my God, I have a 10 page paper that's due tomorrow or due in 10 and I, I, I'm not doing it or I got it under control and it's not happening or worse, they're telling you they did it and they lied. That's a very different, obviously. And I, that's a very different look than, than what we're talking about. And then there's where you're playing a lot of I spy. Is it, is it, is it skill? Is it, I don't know if it, it might be choice and control. It might be time. It does the student know how to plan and prioritize, you know, does the student know how to take something that's long-term and break it down so that they can, so that they can activate, you know, I, we talked before about that, that, that brain heaviness, right? We call it that cognitive overload. The more they have to figure out, the less likely they might activate to do something. So that's all that I spying. I love, yeah, I love that. I've never really thought of that, uh, that definition and the distinction before. So that's, that's really interesting. I guess, I guess that would lead into a, a question I have, which is how do we help I'm assuming this stuff isn't like some, some people, I feel like it's almost innate in like some kids just have this ability somehow, or maybe it's yeah. modeled from the parents and we don't know that we're modeling it. Um, but how do we build that or help our kids discover that ability to break things down, to prioritize, to like, kind of like build these type of muscles to be able to even make those determinations. Is there like, is there ways we can, we can help There's them? Ways. There's no magic elixir, obviously. And I always say this, to there's no magic elixir. This And this takes time, but there's, speaking of, but, mm. <laughs> but there's a few things that we like to do. This is, and, I, and again, you know, I know you have people listening about it, a 10 year old, well, 10 a little young, 13, 18, but here's some rules of thumb. The, what we always, you know, the little thing I say to kids is I say this to parents. It's not about asking your child all the time what they have to do, right? We're really good at going like, what do you have to do today? And they'll go, oh, I have a bio lab. I finished my math test. It's, do you understand what is being asked of you? There's a very different nuanced answer there because here's my thing. If I go to a, a student and say, okay, here's your math assignment. It's page 53, right? Page 53 and you have to do problems one through five. Do you understand what I'm asking you to do? I'm not asking if you understand the math. That's academic. That's a whole other podcast. Not for me. We don't do that. Most students would say, yeah, that's so, I get it. It's very straightforward. I don't have to figure anything out. I want everyone out there to keep going back to that point, that decision-making. Your child's decision-making part of the brain is really, really immature. I don't mean immature in a bad way. It's immature. It hasn't fully developed. So if they, so they're, it's like, they're only capable of lifting a two pound weight. That's all the strength the brain has. So what I've just given you is a task, page 52, problems one through five. I got to figure out nothing. I know how to do it. It's a task driven activity. It's a one-off. Okay. Let's change it up now. And, and your assignment for the night is continue studying. Okay. Right. Anybody right. doing that? Right. Not a chance. Not yeah. a chance. And you know what? I'm sorry. I say this to parents. It's not a chance yeah. that that is going to happen. And I'm not here to disparage teachers, but do you know how much stuff the brain has to figure out? Mm -hmm. What am I studying? How am I studying? What am I supposed to know? How long is this going to take? It's so much. So I want you to think of that boulder again. Put a fork in your student. They're done. So anything like that, whether it's a vague study reference or a long-term, you know, writing assignment needs to be broken down into achievable tasks. And if your child cannot answer the question, do you understand what you have to do? Then it's too big. So isn't it easier to say, pick topic for research paper than it is to like write your paper, right? Mm -hmm. Write your paper. What does that mean? You would never write on a to-do list, and this is going to parent, gas up car, pick up dry cleaning, remodel kitchen. You wouldn't do that. It would be go pick, go to tile store, call contractor for bid. See what I mean? 
very, very task driven. Now bring it down to a student who's executive functioning, planning, prioritizing, all of that is weak. So you need to be breaking things down into the most manageable tasks you can, removing what I call all barriers to entry, because I will guarantee you that's the barrier to entry. Any kind of figuring it out will not be figured out. So not only do we do that, then I, I like them to be able to see it. Remember, externalizing time so they can internalize it. And then the other thing I love to do, and this is my secret sauce, you might say, is anytime I am planning anything long-term for a student, whether it's a paper or it's a studying, I like to put on their calendar or on something that they look at, uh, are you on track day? And that's actually a great procrastination buster if you, if you wanna use that term. Because what that does is it gives your student a chance to breathe. It gives your, your student a chance to catch up, right? Because we're all, you know, we, we, in a perfect world, it would be great if we always did everything that was on our, our planners. I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't, I don't. Yeah. So we need a day to go, okay, nothing new. Are you on track? If you are, guess what? You got to, you know, get out of jail free card, rock on You're, you know, go, uh, go do whatever you want to do or what you have to do. But if you haven't, what we've done here is we've stopped that little rock from growing into that giant boulder. Oh my God, I'm so behind. Oh my God, now I'm really behind. Oh my God, I can't catch up. Oh my goodness, I'm not going to do it. See what we did? We put stop gaps in there because life is real. And I will tell you that my students will tell you that that is the number one thing that actually works for them. That really helps them like catch up with themselves you know, re reorganize themselves, not get overwhelmed and not get overburdened. That is such a, that is one of those tips that, that is one of those tips that could totally, you know, it's, it's great for students and I can totally see how that would, would work, especially since a lot of, you know, you're talking about students being immature, not in a negative way, just in a factual no, not way. in a negative way. And, right. and, and the, what what I, at least from my experience, like looking at my kids and their friends and stuff like that is when they feel overwhelmed, when they get behind, they don't necessarily, or when they feel behind, I should say, they don't have the, the way to step back and say, well, you know, it's, it'll all work out. You know, I just need to like make a plan nope. and get out of it. Like, like the more nope. behind you feel, the more, the more you feel like you're drowning. So having that kind of like structural way. And I think of that, that can apply I think this is one of those, this is one of those tips that even if you don't have kids or you're trying to like enhance your productivity in your work or whatever, that is something that you could totally take and move into your own, your own work, your own practice too. this catch up day. Uh, right? or, you, yeah. you need, you need to pay it. It's like, we call it bubble wrapping time almost. I love that visual, the bubble wrapping, like that, that free, that free time. And it could work beautifully for an adult. I probably do it without thinking I do it. But um, for me, it's like, it's Sunday. I love like the Sunday night thing because it's quiet and it gives me a chance to, what didn't I get done from the week? How do I get myself ready? It, you know, without phones ringing and millions of commitments. But for a student who really has weak, weak planning, prioritizing, organizing time, all of those things to be able to give them a chance. Because the other thing you have to remember is this goes back to choice and control. Their time is not their own. So they might have had a perfect plan in place. And then all of a sudden someone dumps, you know, a new project on them or a new test on them now or, or a practice, you know, an extra soccer practice or a rehearsal or whatever your child is doing. And now that beautiful plan you put in place doesn't work. So it gives them a chance to kind of re reassess. And what I notice is as good as like, a lot, of, a lot of teachers do do that, whereas they will take an assignment and break it down on the rubric and say, okay, you know, Monday, you have to have your topic. Thursday, you have to have your five resources. But that's living in a perfect world. So this way, we do give students a chance to a little have some choice and control of how and when. I wonder if, I wonder if any of this differs based on the level too. And what I mean by that is, I've noticed that there seems to be like pretty big transitions, you know, going elementary school to high school. Yes. A lot of, a lot of students have a lot of problems with this additional, like 
without a teacher there, like holding their hand, making the sure they're doing holding. everything. Yes. Yeah. And then it's, I, I feel like it's even worse going high school to college when like literally nobody is checking in on you. Like at least high school, often parents are kind of like on you to a certain extent, but yes, college, and college. university, college and university, no one's on you. So no does, one is on does, you. does this yes. advice like change at all at the different levels or is it just it's just like building those practices whenever you can we do it we do it from day one like we feel like this is something that needs to be taught from the beginning and what we do see though in colleges our college kids use it more so because you're right in high school there is still a lot of scaffolding not even you know from parents and that's again that's another <laughs> conversation for another day but from teachers as well but once they go to college it's all on them so putting that that planning piece in college is is so important because I always say to a kid it's not about what you have this week it's what you have next week and that's a whole and we didn't really get into this but that's a whole that's the time management that's the future awareness that's knowing that something a week from now two weeks from now even three months from now needs to be worked on now we have plenty of kids in our college coaching practice where they show up it's amazing to me and a professor will say you have one assignment for the entire semester it's a 35 page paper and it has this 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 and this and it's due the last day of the year and if you don't have an academic planner as one of your supplies you're going to fail my class and they're usually right so now i have a kid where most of my students say i love that i get homework every day in a, in, a, in a college class, or I love that I have an assignment every week because it keeps them honest. It's task driven. They don't have to think, remember? There's that whole piece again. They don't have to make decisions. The decision was made for them. Now have somebody hand you a 35 page assignment that you have to now figure out over a course of semester how you're going to get that done. If you have weak EF, that's a lot of kind of what we're teaching. And sometimes we don't we're teaching it, obviously, we get that student in college. We haven't had the chance or the luxury to have them prior, or they never learn that because a lot of students didn't need, you know, again, I don't always blame a kid here. They didn't need to learn it. There's a lot of skill that comes out in college. And there's that whole thing of my kids should have known that. And I'm like, being a college coach, there are so many skills that your student really doesn't learn or need until they actually show up in that environment. Yeah, I think that's pretty common. You have some students that, so I'm gonna I'm gonna use the term, which is, I don't mean it the way it's gonna sound, but who present as smart in double quotes, who they can like just roll through elementary and high school, never yes. have to study. Somehow they just know everything, and they you know they get good grades, so they you know they they people call them smart. Let's put it that way. But then right. they get to college when all of a sudden all of a sudden you can't just roll through and take a test and, and, uh, no. and, and be done. Like it, then it, then the problems start. So yeah, the, the sooner you can build this stuff up, the better. Yes. A hundred percent. What you mentioned time management. So we should probably dig into mm. that a little bit more. Yes. I mean, there's a pretty clear, yes. I think, a relationship yes. between those two. Um, maybe do you have any like, time management skills, you know, you talked about the analog clock and the awareness, but maybe is, is there any like time management specific advice that you ha have for parents or students that they're listening? Well, a lot. I mean, again, it depends on the age of your students. So I'm going to, I just want to keep on one subject. We talked about um, externalizing time. So your child can internalize it. And it doesn't only have to be a clock because I, I know that there are some, in our world, there are some kids um, who can't read an analog. They actually have a difficult time. But our, so we tend to use sand, not that this is a tip, but we tend to use sand timers, um, not that they're perfect, but they're way better than digital. Because what you can do with a sand timer is actually put a label on it that says 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, because they do make them that way. So at least your kid does see, oh, I have a little bit left, I have a lot of it left. But any way that you can externalize time, whether it's an alarm, whether it's a timer, whether it's a planner, whether it's a calendar, any way that you externalize time organically helps your child to internalize it. That's a big thing for me. Planning is another thing. And I, and I think I touched on it a little bit is really teaching your child how to plan. And that for me starts even when they're like in middle school. I just did a column. Um, 
about how a parent says, like, I feel like I'm always nagging my, my child to what do they have going on? And that operative word is that it's not a level playing field. So if you're really looking to kind of like start that conversation and make it not so student focused on your child, who's the one having is you come to the table together. I used to do this in my own home. This came from a, this didn't come from my coaching practice. It came more from my own parenting practice if you say like, and I am marrying, people ask me this all the time, but this kind of got left to me because it's what I do for a living. But I realized with my son that what gave him buy-in was you show me yours, I'll show you mine. Like if I was looking at him through a fishbowl lens only, he wanted nothing to do with it. But if I'm like, listen, all of us need to come to the table on Sunday because you need to know if I'm around for a ride home or you need to know if I'm around to help you study for that exam you have or proof your paper. It, it, it definitely gave him way more buy-in. And that's how we actually started organically teaching time and teaching and teaching planning. Oh, okay. Hmm. I noticed you have two tests on Friday and you don't get home from theater practice till nine o'clock at night. What's your plan? That is probably my number one, number two, and number three question that parents can ask their students to build that future awareness muscle. Mm. It doesn't matter if you have an eight-year-old or an 18-year-old. I have a 23 and a 27-year-old. They don't live with me. I still ask them what's their plan. Because what you're doing is you're creating that future awareness piece. So if you have a little kid at home, what's your plan after dinner? What's your plan after your shower? What's your plan? What you're trying to do is get their brain to focus future. If you have, and I think I just gave you that for a kid that might be older in, in, in high school where you can say, I notice you have two tests on Friday. What's your plan to, and you don't get home Thursday night till 10. What's your plan? You're, you're, you know, we, we do a lot in our work on teaching parents how to ask the right questions to get your child to start strengthening that brain. Again, it's not a, oh, I'm going to ask that question and the world's going to open up. But it's questions like, what's your priority today? Is way better than what you have to do today. When you ask your child what they have to do today, it's keeping them right here. It's keeping them at that two pound weight. It's keeping them on a digital, right? In present time, right. what do I have to do? I change it up and say, what is your priority today? All of a sudden, my EF brain has to do a little work. I'm now maybe going to a three pound weight, right? I'm exercising. Oh. What's the most important thing? What's going to take me the longest? What's due tomorrow? What's my ordination? Do you see that it, it just gets the brain to start thinking differently? And that's how we build these time management muscles, these all these muscles that um, we're talking about. I mean, I could go on forever, but it's that type of questioning that we do a lot of work with. I love that. What's your plan? Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm What's definitely gonna start. Yeah, I'm gonna start using Ask that your one teenagers. for sure. And you can I add anything after that. What's yeah, your yeah, plan? Yeah. Anything. Hey, what's your plan to get that paper done Monday? We're going to grandma's this weekend. What's your plan? And now, if you, uh, I was just gonna say, if you have opinions on what their plan should be, is probably. I'm guessing it's probably better to let them come to you first. And if if it's if their plan sounds you know, re re even remotely ridiculous? reasonable, <laughs> not ridiculous, but if it sounds even okay. remotely reasonable, let them roll with it. Or should you just let like, I'm, I'm, listen, I, look, there are definitely things that are non-negotiable in this world when it comes to, and I, I, okay, I, I'm going to wrap this all the way back because I also do parent coaching. And I really feel that as a parent, it is our jobs to set the parameters and it's your child's job to negotiate them. It's a really interesting way of looking at it, but that is mm. all how I look at it. That is my lens. If you're an eight-year-old at home, that parameter is going to be very little, right? You're going to, you're going to, you're holding tight to those reins as well. You should, but within those tight reins, you can still give, oh, there's those words again, choice and control. Hey, do you want to start your homework at 407 or 417? I'm all about starting things on that's, that's a, that's a ADHD brain is exhausted and tired and needs fun and energy. I don't know who wrote the rule about four o'clock or four 30, like nothing should ever start on the hour, particularly if you're getting started on something we want energy. So four Oh seven or four seventeen, way more fun, way more exciting. But my point is that's just a tip within a tip about how to get pro you want to talk about productivity. My, my kids love that. I'm going to start at four Oh seven because it's different. But anyway, but
but here you are tightly going 407 or 417. You've, you've set the parameter, but now your child has choice and control. So what I would do in that situation is, unless it's really going to be a horrible result for somebody, like, oh, you have the SAT on Saturday and you haven't opened a book yet, you kind of do have the right to say, maybe we need to look at this differently. But if it's, if it's not going to like, you know, the world isn't going to fall down, let your kid go with it. You need ammunition. We tend to really protect our kids and what voiced our opinions and our shoulds on them before they've allowed to even figure out what theirs are. And I feel like unless it involves other people, like a group assignment or something that's a major ticket item, like, oh, you missed the deadline to apply to your college. I feel like, you know what? No one's going to give a rat's, you know what, what your kid got on his Mesopotamia test in ninth grade. No one's going to care. Better that you develop skills that are lifelong skills and, and life skills. So talking Sorry. about should, no, no, I that's good. You agree with me or not. I know a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think, I think that's really awesome. And I, I love the, I love the questions and I love that idea of setting parameters and, uh, and then having them kind of like negotiate that parameters. Negotiate. And like, like you said, it kind of like the parameters widen, obviously the older they get, but it of doesn't course. mean that they're, it doesn't mean that the parameters aren't there. So no, it's um, not a free for all. Yeah. It's like, Hey, yeah. here's what I'm thinking. Do you want to between da da and da 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 or this and that? love that. That's how it works. How it works. So this is uh, kind of on a similar topic in the sense that it involves like shoulds and parameters, I think, <laughs> but I'm very curious of your opinion on Nervous. homework and studying and like oh, environment and stuff oh. like that, because, and <laughs> the reason I ask is because, and this is kind of like goes back. I feel, I feel like you tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like this kind of goes back to what we were talking about, about our definition of what is procrastinating and not, because I feel mm -hmm. like as parents, we have this vision of quote unquote, doing homework or studying, being sitting at your desk with the Get lamp on. turned on, <laughs> you know, sitting at your desk with the lamp oh, turned on right. in silence. In or the maybe quiet. Like, yeah. In the quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. With but the then, door closed. With the door closed. And like, you almost have this vision of how, that's how we did it, but it probably isn't. But then that's how I did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm that, That's how yeah. I did it. Yeah, yeah, I was told like, you know, you don't get up. Not, I wasn't told like in a mean way, but it was yeah, yeah. implied like you sat and you sat in one place and you did your homework until you were done. Mm -hmm. There was, and that is so old school. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's so oh, yeah. Well, now school. you, you know, now I think a lot, and you know, there's obviously this is this is a generalization, but a lot of times you see students like lying on the floor, lying on their bed. There's a, like a YouTube video going, there's like, there's like, they're writing their report on their phone in like the word app on their phone when there's a Why computer not? sitting over there. Like, so do you this. think, it, do you, well, there you go. So, so should a parent be like applying their shoulds to that? Or if the kid okay. gets it done, it doesn't matter. Like, what do you, what do you think about parameters for creating a uh, effective environment or should we let them create that and what works for them? So I have, I mean, this is like a whole other podcast. So I'm going to try to be as <laughs> succinct as I possibly can. So I'm going to talk first about studying because believe it or not, studying is very different than homework. So this is where actually I will look at a student who has been complaining about, oh, I have to do with my you know, homework. I have to do this assignment that way. When it comes to studying, actually, your child does have choice and control. It's really fascinating to think about it. Other than maybe you're, particularly in high school, maybe the teacher hands the student a study guide and says, okay, you have to fill out my study guide and hand it in. Other than that, it's fair game, particularly in college. You can do it. Ev nobody cares how you study. So you have complete choice and control. If you want to use giant sticky notes, whiteboards, make up a song, you know, do a dance, whatever it is you can do. And this is actually where my students go, oh, you know, I never thought of that. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to sit down and make stupid flashcards. I want to, you know, make up a song because I've, I'm a theater arts kid and that's how I think best. So that is actually where I get buy-in and I have to teach them that that in and of itself is valid and allowed. So believe it or not, studying is in that way. You do have more choice and control than you do homework. I am a firm believer in what I call that everyone shows up at the door. 
with their own homework personality and preferences. So you might need to sit at a desk. I might need to lie on the floor. You might need to blast massive, loud, you know, hard rock music. And I want to listen to Hamilton, right? You want to start your homework the minute you walk in the door after school, because you have what I call attention residue, right? You still have that like school feeling and you want to like bring it on, you know, keep going with it. Or you might be the kid, my kid, who couldn't even form a sentence after school. He needed a massive amount of breaks, a break to refuel and recharge and wanted to start later. You might need to sit in the kitchen where there's commotion and people and your brothers and sisters are yelling and screaming and that's how you focus. And some of you might need the silence, not all of us, but there are still kids who say, I, I need to be quiet. Do you know how many different things I just said there? Yeah. <laughs> right? A million, yes. <laughs> that's my point. And that's what yeah. we call our best practices. We call it creating what you, a homework profile. We even have it a download on our site, it's free where there's about 15 or 16 questions that you can answer about yourself. And it's interesting, I've had parents say, I use, I use it for time, not even for homework, just for productivity. I didn't realize that I do better when, you know, I'm doing, you know, listening to loud music um, or I do better when I'm staring outside at the greenery or that there's food next to me. The other thing that I will, cause again, I could, talk about this forever. The other thing that is so powerful, doesn't matter if you're eight or 18 or 38, this is for adults too, is movement. We really learned so much about movement, particularly in the pandemic when kids were in one place going to school and doing their homework. There was no differentiation. Yep. Movement is like drinking a really good smoothie. It has all the good stuff in it meaning it helps with focus, it helps with distractibility, it helps to lay down learning. The more your child moves, the more they can stay like alert and attend and do all things. And my feeling is the quirkier, the crazier, where they do their homework, the better. So I'm known as the girl or woman, probably, that has kids doing math in the bathtub. I have college students who put a pillow behind them, get in that bathtub with their laptop and say they love it because it's fun. It's sensory seeking it. And it, and it just feels like, you know what I mean? Small. And yeah. I have kids sitting on top of the toilet. I have kids sitting under the kitchen table. I have kids in the pantry. This is more younger, not my college students, but the more you move and the more you go, it, it keeps the brain activated, engaged. It takes away what I keep calling that cognitive, like brain drain. So the more you can move, the better off you will be. So it sounds like whatever. So many things we, I just said there. Yeah. You know, no, no, it's good. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's it's good. I, you know, it's it's kind of like taking it to the next level, right? You know, I, yes. we're just thinking, should they even be like at a desk? And it's like, no, yeah. do it in the bathtub, you know, whatever. No, do it in the bathtub. <laughs> so the important part is what works, finding something that works for them. It, it sounds right. like is the most important thing. And then I have a, I have a few, I don't love the bed. I'm going to say that I have a lot of kids that want to spread out on the bed. I'm like, don't spread on the bed. At least go on the floor. You can take mm -hmm. your pillows. You can take your blanket. You can take the 50 stuffed animals you have. I don't really care, but I have a few non -negotiable. Like for me, I don't love the bed because I feel like particularly for kids, I want them to associate their bed for, mm -hmm. to sleep in, like not yeah. a, you know, a multi-purpose room, so to speak. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's just my feeling. And then the other thing is music. I am a massive believer that if your kid needs to listen to music to get work done, you need to allow them. I can't tell you how many parents I have. So I don't let my kid listen to music. I'm like, do you listen to music the minute? I'm like, oh yeah, well, your kid is no different. And what's really, but here's how I do music. And it's, it's really a fascinating thing. So we know that research proven that music helps us to plan, to attend, and to initiate, right? We hear music, it gets us going. I mean, think about it. How many of us are picking our Peloton rides these days by music, right? Music is really powerful in helping us to get going. So I like playlists for my students. I don't like them randomly picking music. So if you work with us, it's like, let's make a playlist. And what some of my older students have different playlists for different subjects. So math might be loud and invigorating, or maybe English and history are a little quieter. But here's what music does. It doesn't only allow you to attend. Music acts as a timekeeper. 
if your student is listening to the same playlist, right, maybe 37 minutes, well, depend again, age, stage, it all depends. What happens is they go, hmm, when I hear the AVET brothers, I know I'm about 20 minutes in. Oh, I just heard Dawes. I know I'm in the home stretch. And that, remember, we talked about future awareness, timekeeping, being able to see time, be able to feel time. Music is that's like the byproduct of it. Mm. It's really powerful because what happens is your child can see done. So, oh, I'm 20 minutes in. Great. I have 20 minutes to go. I'm going to sit up. I'm going to refocus myself. I'm like, I can see, you know what I mean? I can see the end and seeing done for a kid that procrastinates is massively powerful. It's why like we always say you should be working time over task. Because again, you tell your kid to go upstairs and get their math homework done before dinner. What does that mean? Right. <laughs> right. So that time piece for music is really, really powerful because they can see done and don't underestimate the time. Ask any of you parents out there, ask your students about seeing done. They will tell you it's how they keep going. Oh, I love that. Uh, let's talk about planners. So, you know, you've ah. touched on plan. We've touched on planner. We've t- I know, I know it's a topic. I know it's a topic. You're not, oh. uh, you, you don't like talking about, I'm sure. No, I do, I'm kidding, but I don't I'm want kidding, it to I'm be kidding. self. No, I didn't want it to be self. No, 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 no. Okay. Well, let's go this way. So full okay. disclosure, you have a award-winning planner that you sell. So we all know that we established that yes. at the beginning, but okay. taking a step back from that, um, yes. one like a lot, I think even a lot of schools recognize the value of this. And, you know, sometimes parents even have to pay like 10 bucks at the start of the year. Uh, and then their kids are all given oh, yeah. a planner, which then, you know, ends up on the bottom of the backpack or in the, in the uh, locker or something like that. So first of all, do you have any tips for what a planner should, whatever planner it is, what yes. a planner should have, like, what are some good features oh, that it should have? <laughs> Also, yeah, uh, but also like ways that we can encourage or or get students to actually use them uh, if they have them, whether it's yours or a different one or whatever. Sure. Like, of what course. are what are what are some planner some best things? practices? I guess some of my things. First of all, I will tell you what I because we sell um, a great deal of our planners get sold to schools um, and they're used. That's what we do find that when um, when a school purchases our planners, it's for it's for a purpose. It's for the student like they're actually using them to teach, which I, I, I love because, you know, that's it's like I keep saying it's not about what your kid gets on that Mesopotamia test. It's learning how to time manage and plan and prioritize. OK, so I, this is how it all got started. And I have to talk about mine because mine's the only one really that I that I know that I use. Of course, most planners that students are given, right? The old school planners were like Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday were on one side, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are on the other. Your kid can't see time. I want everyone out there, if you hear me say, you can hear it, notice I talk in sound bites a lot, but I feel like that's how people remember information. You have to see time. It's not that, that's as, like, it can begin and end there. Like, for to truly know how to manage your time, to truly learn how to manage time, you have to see it. And those old style planners, they're to do, I call them to-do lists that just basically gives your student a place to write something. So any, I believe, and this is as granular as it gets, that time management is like the marriage between like what you might have to do versus like your appointments and schedule and stuff like that. It's really what I kind of talk about with kids. So you have your classes, you have your after school activities, you have whatever it is, and then you have the stuff you have to do. They need to become BFFs. I'm sorry, I speak to students. So you're, I might sound a little not professional, but you got to understand my audience, All good. right? I speak their language, right? So they've got to be BFFs. Like they've got to like live together. So you need to find a planner that not only gives your kids a place to write what they have to do, but there needs to be a place in that planner that tells them or shows them where they can write when. That when question is way more important than the what. Mm. I want everyone to hear me say that. And I don't care if you're an adult even. The when is more important. You have to be able to know when you have the time. You have to know what you have going on. You have to see it in its entirety to be able to learn how to plan. That's why planners are called planners. I always say that. The kids laugh at me. I'm like, 
They're not called to doers. They're called planners <laughs> because they want you to plan your time. Now, I, I never thought of that. So what, so that's my, I mean, I can give you 14 features, but I think the planner, but that's the, the, that's the cusp of it. Is that then the crux of it? Excuse me. That must, you must be able to see the time for it to be effective. Now, one of the things that we tell parents who come to us and say, I want my kid to write in a planner. I want my kid to write in a planner. Like, that's not the goal. Interesting. And this is coming from the planner girl here. I'm like, <laughs> getting your kid to write in a planner should not be your goal. The goal is, how are they going to see what they have to do? How are they going to see their time? How are they going to marry the two? How am I going to see the difference? Mm -hmm. The planner is the system that achieves the goal. So maybe at that moment and in that time, your child might not be able to write in a planner because writing in a planner is two steps. Remember I talked about chunking things down. You're asking your child to write in a planner. That's two things. So are they even writing yet? If they're not writing anything down, let's just get them to write down first. Then we'll move them to the planner. And when I do that, I get, oh, never would think of it that way. But that's how I think of it. So if I have a kid that's maybe like sticky notes, I'm like, let's go, let's start with that. Let's start with something you're used to doing. Let's start with something you're already doing. Let's start with something that's already making you semi-successful. Then we'll move you. Or if I have a kid that hasn't done anything, I mean, I don't know if you, you know, in my book, I have a whole case study about a kid that wrote on paper towels for a year because he did not want to write, but he thought writing on a paper towel would be fun. We got him to write on the paper towels. We then moved him to a planner. So that's the other thing I do want to like, make sure that parents get that whole, I want to write in a planner makes me like this. I'm like, <laughs> let's not, how do I get kids to write in a planner? by asking them questions. Show me, show me when you have the time. Show me how you're planning your time. When I ask questions and I get like blank stares, I get the, oh yeah, okay. I think you're right. It, I, I don't ever afford, look, I'm a coach. You can't tell anybody what to do, but you can ask a heck of a lot of questions for them to kind of start to formulate. And the other thing is we let them, I, I hate to say it, we let them fail, not fail, but we let them go, hmm, what could, it, what could you have done differently? Oh, I think if I had, so that's part of it. And then the other thing I do, and this is just a silly, crazy thing, is I time my kids. We will, I will give them an assignment, the same assignment, and I'll say, okay, I want you to, I'm going to start the stopwatch, and I want you to open up your planner and write it down. And then I'm going to stop it, and then I'm going to start it again, and I want you to open up an app or your calendar, your Google, whatever it is, and I want you to write it down. Let's see which one takes you the least amount of time. So I have to tell you which one wins all the time. It's the, uh, the right. Well, you use the word right in that whole description quite a few times. So I guess. Isn't that I'm fascinating? Gonna, yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that there, there's something about the, the physical planner that is a lot more effective than. I'm sure there's planner apps out there. I don't know, but I'm going to assume there are, there are. But by the time they have to open it mm -hmm. and find their, yeah. and then they get distracted. And the interesting, and this is, this is research. This is not less, this is not anecdotal. The fastest growing population out there right now using paper planners are college students. Interesting. They have you gone back. Interesting. So, you, so there's this wave of them trying to use apps or whatever, but now going it's like back. heading back. Interesting. They're going back because what, look, we see that and that's in the research. And then we see it obviously anecdotally where they'll come back and say, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't see every, I, I, it's like, I can't see everything. I need to like, you know, that, that create, I know I'm wagging my arms for those of you not watching, but it's like, I need to see everything because it goes back to that whole, it's not what you have now particularly in college it's like what do you have two weeks from now what what do you even have three weeks from now like is your and they they come back and say i need to write it down i need to write it down i need to see everything together all right so let's wrap up the, okay. the student the student topic with sure with uh something that i know definitely a lot of adults struggle with and that is motivation and ah. i'm curious if 
this is something you see with students as well? Like, is it, yes. is, is it just pure procrastination or is, does motivation come into it? So like, what it do you comes. do if they, yeah, if they say, I'm just not in the mood to study or I just had a bad day at school okay. or they, they're like dreading we get that. even getting we get that. started. So, so is there a way you can help with motivation? Not you personally, but parents yeah. <laughs> or, or coaches can help with motivation or is it just something you need to kind of okay. let them sort out for themselves? Well, I mean, I think it comes in many forms. So there's this, like, I just don't feel like it, or I had a horrible day or I'm really tired or so a lot of what we, and this is actually where I think students, believe it or not, have the upper hand sometimes in this than, 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 than you and I. Like I know, you know, relying on my internal motivation all the time is, is tough. You know, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I own my own company. There are plenty of days when I'm like, oh, I'm so not in the mood. And I have to figure out there's how to get myself to do it. Where, what students have that I don't, and you might not agree with me, but what students have that adults don't have is that that peers those peers that are doing and in the same position as them i when i don't feel like like i write my weekly column i don't always want to write my weekly column it takes a lot of brain power i don't call my girlfriend and say hey want to write your weekly column with me she's not right you know what i mean she's not yeah, doing yeah, yeah. that but hey i've my kid all of my students will tell you that their number one number two and number three ways now these are my college kids to stay motivated is phone a friend. Hey, I got to study for that math test. I so don't feel like it. Let's do it together. Because it takes that, co- I'm gonna, I keep, I know I sound like a broken record, but it's important that that cognitive like heaviness, because when you study with someone else, you share the load. You share the motivation, you share the cognitive load, you share the learning, you share everything. Everything just becomes lighter. And here's the deal, bottom line. If, if your kid has a group project and they're meeting at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, I will bet you any amount of money your kid will get up and go because no one wants to be that kid. They don't. No one wants, right? I got them all. No one wants to be that kid. Now ask your kid to get up eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday because he's got to study for his test by himself. Is he getting up? Of course he's not because he's not, there's no appointment television. You know what I mean? I call it appointment television. There's nothing to wake up for. So if you, we, if you body double phone a friend, share the load. We have found that that really cuts through so much of that. I don't feel like it. I don't want to, I'm not in the mood stuff. Now there's kids that have perfectionism and anxiety. And that's a, I don't want to, that's a whole other thing. And I don't want to go there. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about more that every day, you know, how do I get myself motivated to do? So but friends, peers are, are, are like magic. They are. Yeah. I had that situation. Right? Yeah. I had that situation yesterday with my son. He had some math thing that to do and he was dreading it. And then I get home from wherever I was and he's in his room, he's on zoom or whatever teams or whatever it is with his, one of his classmates, his girlfriend's in the room, the younger brother is there in the bedroom and they're all like, they're all working together. To, body like, doubling. To get, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's called so body it's, doubling. Yeah. Yeah. I never, uh, for it. yeah it's called body doubling. And it's really, because what you're doing is like, not only is the body doubling acting as a mirroring image, like I'm doing this, therefore, if you're doing it, I need to be doing it. Right. And, but it also acts as a force field, like an anchor, like, okay, I have to stay put and get this done. But I really like to talk about it from the brain aspect of it lightening that load. If you're really working with somebody, all of a sudden, like, all right, I have to teach you, you have to teach me. It's it's just lighter. Well, everything about it is is easier for that for that kid. And I have to tell you that you know after coming off an 18 month pandemic with with think about what we do for a living. Imagine having you know a population of neurodiverse children that were virtual learning working virtually with was was one of the most magic elixirs we 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 found and it shouldn't end just because the pandemic is you know meaning kids are back in person i should say it that way should not end 100 percent all right. So we always like to wrap up these episodes with uh, something actionable, like a, a productivity tip. So let's say that somebody is a student or, or not, or has kids or not, like 
applies to anything. It could, could be about this topic or anything else. Okay. What's like one productivity tip that you want to make sure that anybody knows that hopefully they would implement after listening to this episode? What's like, what's like one thing that you think somebody who wants to be more productive can do or start doing or stop doing, frankly? Um, am I allowed to repeat something? Please do whatever you like. <laughs> you need to hang analog clocks. You have to have out. You, they are life changing. They're not. They're going to be subtle, but they are life changing because once you start seeing, because it allows you to have that organic conversation of where the game is at five. And this is as pedestrian as it gets. The game is at five thirty. We're leaving at five twenty. What's? Can you show me on the clock? Like what time are we leaving? That's as pedestrian as it gets when you have a little one. But you, even as an adult, you need to see time move so you can internalize time. Analog clocks, I don't care how old you are. Every household needs them. Love it. Well, Leslie, thank you so much. This is great. Oh, and my I pleasure. Have to, I have to tell great. you. Yeah, I have to tell you the analog clock tip. Uh, you are the first person in the history of the productivity show to come up with that one, and uh, I love it. It's uh, it's oh such a great God. tip. I'm I'm, I'm gonna be uh, no no that's good that's oh. a compliment. I'm gonna be going to buy one right after this episode. Yeah. I'm gonna have it in my uh, my cart. So thank you yeah. so much. If uh, anybody so has awesome. if anybody has like questions or wants to learn more about what you're doing, sure. um, where can they find you online? Okay. Where can they get in touch? That sort of thing. Sure. So we make it really easy because we have a product site. I have my own site. The name of my company is Order Out of Chaos. Our website is Order OO Chaos. And from that site, you can read every column I've ever written, books, our our art, my interviews. You can get to our social feeds. You can get to our products, our parent education library. Go there and it will take you wherever, you know, whatever you want or whatever you're looking for, coaching, whatever it is, or webinars. Right on. And so like I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the episode, we're going to have links to that and everything else we talked about in the show notes at theproductivityshow.com forward slash 385. Uh, Leslie, thank you so <laughs> much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. This was a, oh. this is a great episode. I personally learned a lot and I know people listening to this will learn a lot as well. Uh, you ask amazing questions. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. All right. So thanks you all for listening and we will see you next Productive Monday.